My name is Kevin Rudd. I'm president and CEO of the Asia Society. This is our original content series entitled Asian Americans Building America. I called it ABBA and told as a Swedish band, which may have the same name, but there you go. We're speaking with people across the country with different backgrounds who are making a big impact from the Asian American community. And today we're joined by Jenny Dorsey, a Chinese American chef, food writer, and founder of a non-profit studio, A-T-A-O, Atau, stands for All Together at Once. Uh, her company's vision is a world where all people can realize their power to secure equitable, inclusive change. So Jenny, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us about Studio Artel. What inspired it? What does it do? And where do you hope to take it? Yeah, so I started Studio Town in 2018, and it really started with in-person events. So our main event that we were touring across the U.S. was something called Asian in America. It was a six-course dinner experience that included food, drinks, virtual reality, poetry, and spoken word to really examine the different nuances of the Asian American experience and, and Asian American identity. So it tackled topics like the model minority myth or stereotypes of Asian Americans, as well as white saviorism and this kind of pigeonholing of what Asian Americans can, cannot do, or is or is not interested in. Um, so since then, we have pivoted quite dramatically as an organization to do less in-person events and more focused on research um, and creating resources and tools for folks who do want to advance systems-based change. So for example, last year, we put out a big toolkit about what it means for Asian Americans to unlearn the scarcity mentality and really engage with both inter and intrapersonal um, solidarity efforts. So it's all kind of contained within the same wheelhouse, just a different manifestation of it now. So uh, tell me the name, Atau, uh, why that? What's it mean? Yeah, so ITAO stands for All Together at Once. And when we were doing more events-based stuff, it kind of hinted at this idea of bringing together these interdisciplinary mediums and being able to gather people, include people, and have them experience an idea through different ways, both eating it, smelling it, tasting it, drinking it, obviously visually seeing it, hearing it, et cetera. And now I think as we've moved towards more uh, like co coalition building, how do you build resources? How do you really get social change to really stick on the ground? I think it's also a good homage to how many people need to be simultaneously working towards the same future. So whether that means community members, people in positions of power, people who are those bridges, um, there, there's, a, there's space for everyone in the social justice movement. And we also need everyone to participate kind of in their own unique ways. Well, um, so ATAO is an acronym. Here is me thinking of something profound like American Dow or, um, or Asian American Dow. And there was some deep Wish. mystical metaphysical significance to this. It's silly old maybe, me, it was, it was an acronym. Okay. Got maybe we should uh, petition Webster <laughs> for, we could, we could make it into a definition at some point. Yeah, I like that. It's good. So tell us about your own experience. Uh, you're Chinese American. Uh, when did uh, the family arrive in the United States? What part of China? Tell us the story. Yeah, so my I was born in Shanghai. My mom is from Shanghai. My dad is from Sanxi. And I immigrated here when I was about three and a half. Both my parents are scientists. And so they came to the US. They're, I think, tra a traditional kind of story for um, folks who wanted to come here and study. There was a big brain drain, as they would call it, for the global, for global societies everywhere coming into the US. And that we are seeing uh, changes in that sort of going backwards. But discussion for a different day. So I moved to New York where they were studying and uh, stayed in New York for the first five years. We moved to Seattle and I grew up in Seattle and attended college there. And I think one of the, you know, the big experiences that has really shaped me and propelled me to where I am today is really recognizing and understanding how food has shaped my own identity through things like the lunchbox moment, which I think a lot of Asian Americans understand, reflect on all the time. We talk about a lot, but also like how food has shaped my relationship with my own parents or my relationship with myself, how I find partners was very much shaped by what kind of food that they were, are or are not willing to try and what that, what I feel that says about my, me and what that says about them, right? So I think there's so much to unpack and that has really 
yeah, that has been a very pivotal part of being Chinese American. And especially as we now look to this new era where there's a lot of tensions between the US and China, it has been a, it's been a journey to try and understand how do you toe this line where you can be proud of your heritage and your cultural background, you can be anti-authoritarian government, anti-CCP, but you can also recognize that there are problems with how China is represented by Western and US media. So being able to hold space for all of those things that many times feel in conflict or in opposition to one another has been, and yeah, I think the biggest journey for myself. Yeah, well, it's interesting when you talk about the lunchbox experience. I've got uh, two um, Chinese Australian grandkids who were tiny, and uh, so the lunchbox experience I think is a global one. So, mind you, my experience of uh, Chinese Americans, Chinese Australians, or Asian Americans, or, or Asian Australians, is that their lunchbox has always been more interesting than ours as a bunch of Anglo's. <laughs> And usually a lot tastier. So, uh, um, uh, Shanghai and Shanxi, that's quite an interesting combo. That's uh, quite radically different parts of China. Shanghai on the east coast, Shanxi up in the northwest. Is it uh, Xi'an Shanxi or Taiyuan Shanxi? Yes, the latter. Is, so, mm. it's still, it's a little bit more sour than it is spicy, but I think it is <laughs> having them be from such different, they met in Shanghai, but having them from being from different places has also, again, made the food interesting because you re realize there's such a regional palette and that is so underdeveloped that the understanding of that is so underdeveloped here in the U.S. I mean we're barely getting past understanding that you know things like compound chicken or general toast chicken like we still haven't really understood there's so much regional depth to Chinese cuisine and that's one of the you know ongoing education points. <laughs> In your TEDx talk, you said, um, I quote you, we cannot remove pain and only be left with joy, unquote. Um, what do you mean by that? And by the way, how, how do we bring more joy to the Asian American community at a time which has been pretty challenging? Yeah, I would say that pain, when we think about um, the pain, when we remove pain, it's not that if you remove it, there is an absence of pain and suddenly you are just joyful. It's more like you are not dealing with what has caused that pain. I mean, I think the therapist version would be you, you are just ignoring your problems. Um, I think the absence of anything is not necessarily a good thing. It just means it's absent of the thing that you have taken away. And it really asks you to contemplate what is so scary about that pain. Of course, we don't like physical pain. Of course, we don't like emotional pain. But what is it that is so scary or feels full, so vulnerable to you that you have to reject and ignore it as opposed to really looking at it and see how it has shaped you and acknowledge it and perhaps be, be grateful for it in a certain way. And I don't mean this to be like, everything happens for a reason. You need to be so happy for all the things that you have you know, suffered through life, but more just taking stock of who, what has made you who you are. Um, and in some ways, finding joy in that too. I think there can be joy in, um, overcoming, there can be joy in being able to say this terrible thing happened, but we were able to band together and we were able to do something great um, in spite of it. So when you ask, how do we bring more joy to the Asian American experience? Asian Americans have done so much in this country. I mean, we basically built this country, right? In addition to Black Americans and Indigenous Americans, like but like we, there would be no America without us. And in spite of all the racism, in spite of all these terrible things, like we have been able to overcome. So I think part of that is we can't have that joy if we don't acknowledge where, where a lot of that pain come, came from because of things, right? Like Vincent, like we were able to say, this is a problem and we're gonna do something about it. And we did, we followed through. And that's something that we can collectively be proud of and feel motivated to do more about. Um, tell us about your own experience. Have you been on the receiving end of racism, discrimination, um, abuse? Uh, what's it been like growing up as a young Chinese American kid? Uh, you've been in New York, which is progressive. You've been on the West Coast, which is reasonably progressive. But I imagine you had a few experiences too. Yeah, I think what was really hard is I a lot of the the kind of covert racism that I experienced growing up. I didn't understand and I internalized as this, well, I, I, I want to assimilate. So therefore I need to be as far away from the people that they are, you know, mm. mocking. So how, how do I be, how do I set myself 
part as much as I can from my parents or the fobs, right? Like, I don't want to be seen and depicted as fresh off the boat. I don't have an accent. I used to, you know, I, I think when it comes to, um, like, I like to say this in gender norms, it's like a lot of, I'm not like the other girls energy, but I'm not like the other Asian people energy. And I think a lot of Asian Americans have come full circle on their journey in many ways through that lens of what does it mean to stop constantly running away from what felt like an ugly part of you because I needed to dye my hair. I needed to have my eyes look bigger. I needed to have my nose look pointier, like anything that I could do so that I could be less Asian and be more white. I think that was, that was what's hard. And, you know, all those microaggressions, I can't remember from when I was 10, but I remember thinking to myself, there's something fundamentally wrong with me. My, both my parents are lactose intolerant and I'm like, oh, look at this, I'm fundamentally wrong with their genes. Like, why can't they be like French people and eat cheese all the time? You know, that sort of self-doubt, that sort of self-hatred. Like, I think that was the hardest thing. Um, but now these days, especially working in social justice, I think I just see the microaggressions a lot. I see it come out because people in a weird way are on their best behavior, but you can't hide all the things that you have learned to do. And if you are not constantly practicing, if you if the, if you talk with racist undertones to, to other folks when you're around them, and then all of a sudden you're around an Asian person, all of that stuff comes out. You know, they do that you can do your best to kind of hold it back, but it comes out. Just the other day I was um, dining with a friend of mine and her white fiance. And he we were having Korean barbecue. And literally within two minutes of us being in the Korean barbecue restaurant, surrounded by other Korean and other Asian people, made a comment about Koreans eating dogs. And I was so shocked and taken aback, but it just serves to show you can have your Asian spouse, you can have your Black friend, doesn't make you not racist. And I think that is the struggle that we're still in the middle of. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, true. And you see food as a way to punch through this. I think food is a really, is a battleground for this. Um, it can be good to punch through and it can also make it worse. So if you think about why are people so anti MSG, it's not because MSG does anything to you because then you can't eat any Pringles or I don't actually don't know if Pringles has MSG, but I would assume so because almost all CPG products have it. So I think all the ideas that we have about food and the cultures behind food, it never remains with that food item itself. It's always about the people behind it. You know, we don't say racist things about watermelon because we feel certain ways about watermelon. We say them because we feel certain ways about Black Americans. And similarly with Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, all, you know, all the whatever. It's when we make weird comments about curry, it's not because we have some feelings about this in a inaccurately named blend of spices that we don't understand and whatever curries a whole can of worms but it's because mm -hmm. we have these feelings or we are implicitly saying something about a group of people and that's why it's food can be such a touchy subject for so many people a sensitive topic to address and also one that people get very very defensive about it's funny on the food question, uh, when I was Prime Minister of Australia, I used to uh, often deliver speeches which would begin with the following line, thank you uh, for those of you who come from a world to uh, enrich uh, our Australian community and society. And thank you in particular uh, to our friends uh, from Asia who have made Australia their home and for liberating us from English cuisine. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, it's a, one thing the English and the Germans never did well was food. <laughs> I will say there are some things that I love from both England and Germany. Um, you know, there's, yeah, there's yeah, great yeah, sauerkraut. Yeah, yeah name them. <laughs> I, grew, I, I grew up on this stuff, Jenny. So. <laughs> hey, I, I think, mean, I think, I think in the UK now, there's did. definitely more progressive cuisine as well. Yeah, progressive means non-English, so uh, it's great. <laughs> the, um, finally, uh, what gives you hope? You know, you're in the, um, in the, uh, the forefront of this movement of dealing with um, uh, racism against Asian Americans and racism more broadly. What gives you hope as a young American? You're proud to be an American? 
Uh, proud to be an Asian American, proud to be a Chinese American. What gives you hope? I think what consistently gives me hope is looking at youth movements and seeing how organized and how respectful and also just how much movement they have really built and continue to build despite older folks, or doesn't even mean older folks, but really like people in their 20s or 30s, constantly diminishing their light. Like we have seen so much youth activism and it's so inspiring and they are, truly are so organized, very self-sufficient and also really accepting of, of people within their movements who are different, who might have different ideas. And they are really paving the way for what mutual aid looks like, for what coalition building looks like. Um, and just because they are younger or have less years of experience doesn't mean that we can't learn hugely from their work. And so that's something I always look at, you know, I know people scoff at it, but TikTok activism is important and it has a role to play in the social justice movement. And it has reached a lot more people than probably some of our more traditional grassroots campaigning has. So I think it's really mm -hmm. important for us to look at that and emulate that and support that and shine light on that. Jenny Dorsey, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate uh, you sharing your creative vision for food and for vulnerability and for breaking down barriers and all the work you're doing to bring social justice to the world uh, and the Asian American community. My name is Kevin Rudd. I'm from the Asian Society. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.